talk about what your dog wishes you knew about separation anxiety. Separation anxiety is a common problem in dogs. And unfortunately, the early warning signs are often very easy for pet owners to miss. What exactly is separation anxiety? In case you're not familiar with this term, sometimes people call it separation anxiety. They may refer to it as separation distress or separation related distress. But either way, what we're talking about is the distress that dogs experience that's associated with the real or perceived separation from a person or persons to whom they are attached. And what I mean by perceived is that these are often dogs that if you just step outside to take out the trash or go to the mail, they'll be scratching or whining or barking at the front door. Uh, if you go to into the bathroom and you close the door behind you and the dog sits outside and whines and scratches, that's because they're experiencing a perceived separation from their attachment figure. So the clinical signs specifically that, that we're talking about include panting, pacing, whining, trembling, trying to hide, or sometimes these dogs will try to interfere with you leaving and act like they want to dart out the door with you. Many people come home to find that their dog has been salivating and the entire you know, chin and front of their chest is wet from saliva. And these signs, like you saw in this dog here, they can vary from very mild to very severe, where the dog is essentially experiencing a, a state of panic. So an increased heart rate, an increased respiratory rate, and even increased blood pressure may be present as well. Of course, you can't see those things, but that's what's going on anytime a dog is experiencing real anxiety. At its most severe, dogs may eliminate in the house, destroy things, or vocalize excessively if they have separation anxiety. Whenever the owner is gone, these situations may occur. In some cases, these dogs will even do great harm to themselves uh, in their frantic attempt to break out of cages or break out of the house. They can break off toenails and teeth even and really, really harm themselves. It just depends on uh, how confined they are and where they are confined. But unfortunately, some owners never know that their dog is experiencing separation anxiety until they come home to find this type of damage. Or maybe a neighbor complains this dog is barking or crying all day long. But what you want to be aware of is that before you see the type of damage here in these pictures, the dog may have been suffering for weeks or even months with lower levels of anxiety before they get to this point. Now, the fact is anxiety worsens with time and repetition of the situation. Essentially, these dogs feel anxious being alone. So due to the type of learning called classical conditioning, they associate their feelings of anxiety with being alone or confined. And every subsequent experience of being alone or, or being confined in this particular situation causes that emotional state. And with subsequent repetitions of that experience and those feelings, the anxiety gets worse and worse and worse. And eventually, some of these dogs will show extreme anxiety just because they see their owner getting ready to leave. But some dogs don't show that active pacing behavior when their owners are departing, uh, again, until the problem becomes very severe. Some dogs do demonstrate what we call hyperattachment. They follow the owner from room to room. They become anxious when the owner departs, and they often greet exuberantly upon return. So a very long, for a very long time, those three things were what we expected to happen in every case of dogs with separation anxiety. But truthfully, now what we know is that some dogs have separation anxiety and don't show these signs, 
like I said, they may only demonstrate their anxiety when they are truly alone. And other dogs that demonstrate hyperattachment don't experience separation anxiety. I've had a couple of dogs like that. So what's an owner to do, right? How do we determine if our pet has separation anxiety? Well, the best way to determine whether or not a dog has separation anxiety with 100% certainty is to video them just for a few minutes while you are gone. And usually it's in the immediate moments after you leave that the dog is going to feel most anxious. And a lot of people say, oh, I don't have the equipment to do that. But pretty much everyone has a cellular phone nowadays. And all cellular phones, to my knowledge, have the ability to video. So what you can do is set up something like you see here. If you are already crating your dog, you're not sure, just set your phone up to video the dog, turn it on, and leave the house. Get in your car, drive around the block, and then come back. However long you can give it safely, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, even five minutes sometimes is enough to determine if the dog has separation anxiety. Just do be aware that dogs know when you really leave. So don't try to fake them out by just going outside and lingering around the front door. If your dog is not being confined, if it's still just loose in the house and you're not sure what's going on, then set your camera up or your video, your cell phone to aim at the front door or whatever door it is that you depart from. And with their wide, pretty wide field, they're gonna get the behavior of the dog in that immediate area. And even if the dog leaves that area, you will probably hear it on the video when you check it later. And you may know that they're going into another particular room. And next time, try it again with the video in that room. Or maybe they leave the front door and they go sit uh, and stare out the window. If you know they're likely to do that, try aiming the video there. Because regardless, you are going to get probably enough video to determine whether or not this dog has separation anxiety. And so you will come back and look at that video and you may see something like this. And this is a good example of a dog whose owners had no idea that it was really experiencing separation anxiety until they decided to, to put a camera on it and see what happened. This dog is not yet at the point where he's harming anything, but he is very, very anxious. And if left untreated, this behavior will get worse. His anxiety will worsen until at some point he may be harming himself to escape that cage. If your dog is not uh, confined in a crate, if you just leave him home in the room, you may get video that looks like this. And again, you see the dog is not always in the, the camera view, but you can hear it whining if you've had the audio and it paces back and forth. Just the appearance of this dog is one of anxiety. And if you have any doubt about what you're seeing, you can usually share your video with your veterinarian or a veterinary behaviorist and determine whether or not your dog is really anxious about your being gone. A lot of people ask me, can you predict who will get separation anxiety or, or why does my dog get separation anxiety? And I really like to reassure people that we truthfully do not know exactly why some dogs get separation anxiety and some don't. But we do know a lot about what is not at fault. One of the things is we tell people, it doesn't matter your breed, the sex of the dog. It, that's not a factor. Where right? you get the dog doesn't even appear to be a factor. This behavior is not caused because you spoiled your dog. So don't let people make you feel guilty about it. You can spoil that dog rotten, carry it around the house, never let its feet touch the ground. That does not mean it's going to get separation anxiety. It may, it may not. The family type that it lives with isn't a factor. Again, traditionally, I think a lot of people think of the dog with separation anxiety as that little dog belonging to a single woman who just dotes on the dog, spends all her time with the dog, and 
never lets its feet touch the ground. But studies have shown that dogs come from all types of families, whether it's a married couple with no children or a family with a bunch of children. Dogs can get separation anxiety. And the last important factor is exercise. Lots of people who come home to a home that's been destroyed by a dog with separation anxiety say, oh, he just needs more exercise. He's bored. If it was that simple, I wouldn't have to be here talking to you about it because we could avoid these problems. This is not about boredom. It's not about lack of exercise. These dogs are experiencing an emotional problem. They are severely anxious. And if you take that anxious dog and you just exercise it a lot more, what you are going to end up with is a very fit, anxious dog, and it will not solve your problem. How do we treat it? Well, the first thing I would suggest you do if you think your dog has separation anxiety is speak with your veterinarian. And if they're unable to help you or they don't treat a lot of behavior problems, ask them to refer you to a veterinary behaviorist. Because treatment for these conditions is going to be multimodal. It's not extremely simple and straightforward. For example, it, it should involve all of these particular components that we'll talk about here. The first is what we call avoidance and safety. Then we focus on improving the relationship. Then pharmaceutical or non-pharmaceutical interventions of some kind are almost always going to be necessary, depending on how severe the problem is. And then there's a certain amount of behavior modification that can be used. But for behavior modification, I urge people to find a, again, a veterinary behaviorist or a qualified trainer with advanced training in animal behavior and behavior modification to help you. Because many people try behavior modification on their own, and it can make the pet worse if you're not very, very careful. So what do I mean by avoidance and safety? Because this is an approach we take to every behavior problem. The number one step is to stop this cycle of worsening anxiety. And it would mean you would never leave your pet alone, but... Maybe during lockdown, you haven't been able to leave your dog at home. You've been home with it a lot. But most of the time, people can't just stay home from work and never leave their dog alone while they treat this problem because it can take many months to successfully treat this problem. So you have to do the next best thing. You either find somebody that can house fit your dog or you take it to dog daycare, which I know can get expensive or you have friends or family members whom you can take the dog to stay with when you have to leave the home. If you can't do that, the next best thing is to try to find a place in the home where the dog is at least somewhat more comfortable, maybe not showing that really severe panic that they maybe ha have been showing. And due to the classical conditioning I mentioned earlier, it's very common that dogs also associate their anxiety with the place they're feeling anxious. And this is why if you've ever crated a dog and had them tear out of it, and maybe you keep trying to get new crates, you get to the point where you, you can't get the dog in there because it's very you know, distressed about going into the crate. So the next best thing means that you want to put the dog in a different place where it is more comfortable than it was where it had previously been left, even if it's just a little bit more comfortable. And since a lot of times you also want to uh, avoid any further destruction or damage to the home, doing this can be helpful for that reason as well. You want to find some place like a, a bathroom or a laundry room or something like that where the dog may feel better and yet it can be kept safe. And this is just an example of a, a test that a pet owner did to see. Their dog who'd been anxious in a different confinement, maybe he's less anxious here. And what you see in fact is that this dog is anxious, but he's not experiencing 
abject panic. And of course, if you were doing this for real, you, you wouldn't leave the leash on the dog. You would try to make the, the room pet safe by putting up cords and that sort of thing. But you would want to test this and do a video and see if the dog was a little bit more comfortable in this other area and begin leaving the dog in this different place when you have to go. The other thing that it is really important to do as a part of improving that relationship with our pets is to stop all punishment. Punishment increases anxiety. It basically teaches the dog that it's going to feel bad while it's alone, and then it's going to feel bad when the owner comes home. And what a horrible state of emotional conflict that must put the dog in. He's thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so upset because my owner is gone, but oh gosh, it's going to be terrible when they get home. And, and that's a horrible place for any individual to be. You want to be aware that that guilty look does not mean that the dog knows what it did was wrong. It only means the dog knows you are upset. And punishing it when you come home to find this uh, destruction will not solve this problem. In fact, it will make it worse. So if the dog has separation anxiety that's relatively mild, or at least he's not harming himself, then I'd still suggest you speak to your veterinarian or a qualified behaviorist about treatment. But what I urge you to do is if you get over the counter type of thing, please be sure to use the product for which there is some science. And those are the ones I'm mentioning to you here today. There is a product made from L-theanine and L-theanine is just an amino acid found in green tea. It's been shown to be calming in several different laboratory studies, human studies, and in a couple of dog studies. alpha casozapine is another product. It's a milk protein, and it is available in this um, product here called Vilkine. It's also available in some foods. And this is an ingredient that has been shown in multiple studies of laboratory animals and humans to have an, a calming ability. And some studies, some studies have been done, done in dogs and cats as well. Then there's also pheromones. Uh, Adaptal, which is the dog appeasing pheromone, has been shown to help decrease signs associated with separation anxiety. And what I always urge people to do is try one of these and every few days check a little bit of video and see if you see a difference. If one of them alone doesn't work, you could add another. You could give all of these things at the same time. But what I, again, urge people to do is don't waste your money or waste time with the poor dog experiencing anxiety by using things that there's no science behind. Most botanicals, um, there's a product called Rescue Remedy, CBD. Everyone asks me about using CBD for separation anxiety. We don't have any data yet. So don't go to those products first. At least try the things first that we have some science behind. And if those don't work, if you get desperate, I certainly understand trying uh, anything you can find. But again, don't let the dog suffer while you experiment with things that, that may not work. Lastly, if the dog is already at a point where they're really harming themselves or their, their anxiety, their fear is profound, then talk to your veterinarian about medication. You do not have to be afraid about using the medications that we have today available for separation anxiety. Um, there are lots of choices. Many of these drugs are, are not addictive, which is, I know, one of the things people worry about. Um, they can be safe if used appropriately. And like I said, there's lots of different choices. This is not a one size fits all. What is important is that you be willing to be patient and try something, monitor with videos, see if the dog gets better. And if it doesn't, go back, talk again, add something else. Many of my patients end up, 
and, and again, my patients are going to be the worst of the worst because I'm a specialist, but many of them end up on multiple drugs and, and maybe some nutraceuticals all at the same time. The hope is that with nutraceuticals and pheromones, we can decrease the amount of drugs that they may need. But sometimes medication is necessary to relieve the anxiety in these dogs. Since we say we don't know what causes separation anxiety, uh, it's kind of hard for us to really give great suggestions for how to prevent it. We can't know if we can prevent it. But I will tell you that I have basic rules of thumb that I often recommend for people who want are raising a new puppy or they have a new dog from a shelter to try to keep them from developing separation anxiety. And the most important thing is that you increase alone time gradually and that you make sure that the pet is okay about being alone. If you have to drag the dog into the, the crate, uh, if the dog is tearing up the crate and trying to, to get out, they act afraid of the crate, then they're not comfortable there and you should never ever force them into that situation. So you need to teach them to be alone gradually. And you could do that by making the crate or confinement area pleasant by always leaving the dog special treats in there, feeding the dog in there when you're home, tossing treats in there periodically, and feeding uh, the dog, leaving the dog with a, some kind of long-lasting treat when you get ready to leave. Now, if you come home and the dog has not eaten, if you have one of those dogs that never eats any treat you leave for it, and when you come home, they're eager to run over there and start eating the treat because you're home, that suggests that the dog has separation anxiety. So you want to ask for help. It's also suggested that you keep your arrivals and departures very low key. So don't make a big deal about leaving. Don't make a big deal about coming home because all that may do is ramp up the dog anxiety and teach them to associate, you know, a very excited emotional state with your coming and going. And we don't want them to do that. We want them to learn that it's okay to sit there and relax, that you are going to be home. And the last point is to never, ever use your crate for punishment because you can't really have it both ways. You can't make the crate or the confinement area a pleasant place that the dog loves to be if you also use it to punish them. So you don't ever want to punish the dog by confining it to the crate. So just to summarize, again, this is a very, very common problem. Probably as many as 20% of dogs in this country may experience separation anxiety. And my biggest concern as a veterinary behaviorist is that a lot of these animals experience silent suffering. They suffer for a very long time being anxious before they ever perform behaviors that are worrisome enough to their owners that the owners seek help. And it's important that you recognize it early. You want to treat early when an animal has any behavior problem so you can increase the chance of success at treatment because it is common that problems worsen with time, especially anxiety or fear-related problems. So the first myth that I want to share with you is one that I hear all the time. People say to me, oh, but he knows what he did was wrong or she knows what she did was wrong. And I always want to ask them, if you think the dog knows what they did was wrong, why do you think they keep doing it? Because most dogs are not purposely being vengeful or spiteful or, or trying to anger you in spite of what you may think. And if you're at all familiar with the public dog shaming that was popular a few years ago, you may have seen memes like this one. So it demonstrates that it's very common for people to believe that because of the way a dog acts, when you come home to find that they have destroyed something or gotten into something that they shouldn't have, then that must mean 
that the dog knows what it did was wrong. But I ask you to take a look at this particular dog and see how he's avoiding being looked at. His ears are tufted. His body language says he's afraid, and it's because he's at the veterinary clinic. What about this dog? Hopefully, you recognize that the tucked tail this dog is demonstrating, the tucked head or the flattened head and the lowered ears and the panting tell you that this dog is also anxious or afraid about being in the veterinary clinic. And that looks very much like this. The, the it's appearance of a dog that you often see when you come home to find that something has gone wrong while you were home. Even the little uplifted foot that you see on this dog, the right foot that's slightly uplifted, is what we call an appeasement gesture. And it tells you that the dog is anxious. It's worried about what's getting ready to happen. These dogs are anxious, worried, or afraid because their owner has yelled at them in the past or been angry in the past. And now they're showing typical avoidance behavior, behavior that says, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I'm no threat to you, please don't be mad at me. That doesn't mean that they know what they did minutes or hours ago was wrong. So the fact is that this guilty look that we see is really just anxiety or fear. And many people say to me, but Dr. Times, I've never yelled at my dog before. And they do that the first, you know, the second uh, I arrive home. Well, remember that dogs are extremely sensitive to body language. They are excellent at reading body language. So all you have to do is not necessarily get in their face and yell at them, but come home and see what the mess is and look unhappy. And that look of being upset is what dogs learn to associate with you coming home. That doesn't mean that they know they are getting yelled at because of that mess. What they've learned to associate is the presence of the owner, the presence of the mess, and that means I'm going to be yelled at. You see, timing is everything. Animals learn by making an association between one event and another, or between their behavior and the consequences. But those associations can only happen in their mind if the event or the behavior and the consequences are associated very, very closely in time. Basically, punishment or reinforcement has to occur within two to three seconds at the most after a behavior in order for the dog to associate it with the consequences um, related to the behavior that just occurred. It also has to happen every single time if you want there to be long lasting learning. So if you come home, and you find this, just remember that if, you, if your dog acts afraid or if you yell at it, all you're doing is teaching it to fear you're being home and having this mess in the house. They don't have the ability to, next time they are alone in the home, plan forward and realize, oh, I shouldn't tear this up because I'm going to get in trouble later. They just can't make those associations. Another myth that's very common and gets people in trouble is the one where we believe, well, any dog that disobeys, um, it, it must be being dominant. Everyone really wants to blame dominance on every problem. I've heard people say uh, that because the dog is being aggressive, it's dominant. That if it growls because you're trying to examine it or take blood at the veterinary clinic, it's being dominant. I even had someone say, Say to me once that they believed the dog was dominant because it resisted going into its kennel. And again, I want you to look at the picture here and realize that this behavior, this, this body language that you're seeing is body language of fear or anxiety. And in most of these situations I've named here, 
the dog misbehaves because it's afraid or anxious. In addition, this myth known as the dominance myth is something that has been completely disproven. Let me tell you a little bit about how it came about. So the first thought about this concept of dominance with any kind of dog came about when people studied wolves early on. And they studied these dogs that were, or these wolves that were in captive wolf packs. And they made assumptions about what this behavior meant when they saw aggression and they saw um, these interactions. And what they didn't realize is that the wolves were behaving very differently because they were captive. They weren't exhibiting normal behavior. With time, when people began to be able to watch and follow wolves in the wild, they learned that that's not at all how they behave. They learned that wolves live in these closed family groups and that the only time they really ex exhibited aggression was if an outsider tried to intrude. They didn't allow outsiders into their group, but that, that pack was formed, it was of just a family group. And there was no more aggression in there than you can suggest that, you know, there's aggression between any immediate family members in a normal situation, right? You can tell your children what to do, but that doesn't mean you're going to be aggressive to them. And you see the same thing in a wolf family. There may be moderate amounts of discipline going on, but not aggression. What is also important to understand is that in these situation uh, within wild wolf groups, submission or deference to a more dominant animal is something that's offered. It is not taken. It is earned by the dominant animal. The dominant animal is simply the animal that uh, has the most knowledge of where to find food and water. It's basically the, the one that keeps the pack safe. They're not the most aggressive and other animals defer to them because that's what these animals are basically programmed to do. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. But what we've learned about domestic dogs in this time also by studying free ranging dogs is that they don't live in closed family groups. They live in very open groups. They allow dogs to come and go. And aggression is uncommon and exhibited primarily occasionally when there's somebody arguing over a resource, but they don't form strict hierarchy. So while some hierarchical behavior may be common between dogs, there is rarely a strict linear aggression, even within your or a strict linear dominance, even within your group of dogs at home. Because, and there's also rarely aggression unless there's a serious problem. In most cases, with either dogs or wolves, squabbles are settled using very ritualized signaling, not overt physical aggression. Outright aggression is not adaptive. It is not what is normal for dogs or wolves. Again, within dogs, you may see behaviors like this, where the dog on the left is standing over the other dog, and the dog on the right is deferring. That doesn't necessarily mean that the dog on the left is dominant to this other dog, because dogs are more likely to have changing um, positions, if you will. For example, the dog on the left may simply care more about getting to sleep on that sofa. So he's telling the other dog, no, you don't get to sleep on that sofa. And in another context where a bone or a toy was involved, it might be that the dog on the right cares more about the toy and they might have an interaction like this and the dog on the right might be the one that comes out looking dominant. So maybe there's this type of behavior going on between dogs, 
But the fact is there's no evidence whatsoever that any animal attempts to place humans within its hierarchy. That's just not really the way of the natural world. And in fact, most dogs are too anxious or fearful to be trying to take over the world. The majority of, of aggression behavior that we see in veterinary practice is related to fear or anxiety. Myth number three sort of follows up with that other one. It's when people say, oh, that bite just came out of the blue. It was completely unprovoked. The fact is, dogs always have a reason for anything they do. So it's very unlikely that the behavior was unprovoked or that it came out of the blue. Maybe inappropriate, and we may not like it, but it's probably or possibly normal for the dog. And the reason we hear those comments about uh, dog bites just happening out of the blue are because most people fail to read dog body language. And many of the veterinary behaviorists will tell you that a leading cause of many of the problems that people have with their pet have to do with not being able to read body language. The fact is, if you look at this dog and child interaction here, most people's instinct is to say, oh, look, that is so sweet, a boy and his dog. When if they looked more closely, what they would see is a dog that is very uncomfortable about the interaction that he's having. The dog is telling us he doesn't like this, but most people don't pay attention. If this dog bit the child, next time the child tried to hug him like this, it would be horrible, it would be tragic, but would it shock me? No, it wouldn't shock me at all. Is it inappropriate? Yes, but it would not be out of the blue or unprovoked because to the dog, this is very provoking. So let's talk for a moment about how dogs communicate. The fact is most social animals communicate using a lot of ritualized signals. Remember I said that overt aggression is not adaptive. If animals fought over every single thing they wanted in life, they would die before they could grow up and, and breed and pass on their genes. So look at this diagram here that is often called a the ladder of aggression, some people would rather we call it a stress escalation ladder. Doesn't matter to me what you call it. I want you to understand that it represents how dogs communicate. On the bottom, what you see, the yawning, the blinking, the nose licking, the turning the head away, these are the early signs that a dog exhibits that say, I am not comfortable with this interaction. If, as an example, dogs were to be in the dog park and you saw a dog doing that and another dog started to approach it, assuming both of those dogs are normal animals and don't have any kind of problem, the dog that's approaching would see this behavior and would turn and walk away. Or it might change the way it greets the other dog. But dogs read these messages and we tend to ignore them. So if the first message the dog sends isn't paid attention to, then their response to this perceived threat will likely increase, or at least they have the ability to increase it. So they may try to walk away. They may start to show you those signs that say, I'm fearful or anxious with ears dropped and head dropped. They may stand crouched with their tail under. All of those signs are signs meant to make somebody stop because the dog is saying, I'm not comfortable with your, with your approach. And if none of those things work, then the dog may take the more offensive stance, growl, snap, or bite. And I'm not saying that this will happen with every single dog every time. I've had Labrador Retrievers for 20 years, and I can't think of what I could do to them to make them climb that ladder and bite me. 
Maybe if they'd been hit by a car and were laying there in severe pain and I'm trying to drag them off the road, yes, that might provoke a bite. What causes a dog's behavior along this ladder has everything to do with their genetics, their experiences, what they've learned, and how they perceive a threat. It's also important to be aware that dogs may jump up and down on this ladder. They may go from one to the other and it's not always perfectly linear. I have seen dogs snap first and then go to showing all of these other gestures. But we just wanna be aware that dogs are trying to communicate with us. They are communicating with us using these visual cues that tell us they're uncomfortable. And they may include avoidance behavior. So if a dog tries to walk away, we should not be pursuing them. It often includes what we call displacement behavior, which may be lip licking, yawning, suddenly stopping and scratching or licking at a body part. These are all behaviors that suggest that the dog is not comfortable. So we need to pay attention to them. And an example of, again, how it might potentially get a, a family in trouble is in a situation like this. If you look at this dog, you should be able to see that it is uncomfortable with the baby's approach. It's humped over, its tail is tucked, it's eyeing the baby out of the side of its eyes. This is not only a very dangerous situation, we should never allow our children around dogs when they're eating, but again, this dog is communicating it is uncomfortable with the baby. And if we ignore it, the longer it's exposed to the baby, then it's only going to feel worse. You're not going to make it better by forcing it into this situation. So remember, animals just communicate with us the only way they know how, and that is with body language. So truthfully, they don't usually bite out of the blue. They do after having given you lots of warning signs that we unfortunately tend to ignore. Myth number four is another dangerous one. This is the one that people believe, and unfortunately, some veterinarians continue to to repeat that puppies shouldn't be exposed to any other dogs or anything until after they've had all of their shots. They should be kept at home and, and therefore kept safe. Well, that goes against what we know about dog development because dogs experience developmental periods at which different things are being learned. And their socialization period the one that lasts from between about 20 days to 12 weeks of age, maybe 14 weeks of age, is a critical period of time in which they are most able to learn about new things, new people, new experiences, and learn, hopefully, not to fear them if they have good experiences with them. If they have bad experiences at this time, it can actually lead to long-term fear. So it's a very sensitive period of time. And if you wait until the time when most dogs have had all their shots, which is usually closer to 14 or 16 weeks, you have missed that very important socialization period. What is socialization? A lot of people are, are really don't understand what this means. So let's define it here. Socialization is what we do for a young animal that involves graduated exposure to a variety of environmental stimuli in such a way as to have a positive experience and it increases social skills and adaptability for the future. Good socialization is how we raise a good family dog. So as of just a review, again, we're talking about a sensitive period that occurs from about three to 14 weeks of age and socialization is a skill, if you will, or the ability to be socialized could be referred to as a skill that declines in ability over time. 
So don't think of these developmental periods as you know, doors that slam shut. Think of them as windows that gradually close. So just because you get a dog at 12 to 14 weeks of age doesn't mean you can't socialize it, but you need to be very careful to be sure that you're not causing it any fear in the process or that it hasn't already had fearful experiences and that it's not showing any fear. Because again, you want to expose them to as much novelty as you can but in a very positive way. And what is critical, we must never forget that the puppy has to have choice. So you don't force them into the situation where they may be unsure. You allow them to have that experience and then you reward them with play, food treats, that sort of thing. So good socialization requires that you learn to watch for subtle signs of fear and anxiety. And we've already talked about those now, you know what they are. And to use just a certain amount of your common sense. So we never recommend that puppies be taken to dog park or that they be walked anywhere where unvaccinated, unwormed dogs uh, have been. We want to keep them in safe places. And ideally, that is a properly run puppy class where you take the puppies between the ages of about eight to 12 weeks and allow them to interact with other puppies and learn about new people, ideally about children. Oftentimes someone in the puppy class will have children, but it is not about training. This is not about obedience at this time. It's about teaching the puppy good social skills. And if you're not familiar with it, I have to just mention that the dog appeasing pheromone, which also comes in a puppy collar, has been shown to help puppies be more relaxed, learn faster, be, uh, become better socialized, and have less fears and anxiety. So it's well worth doing, especially at a time like now during COVID when you may be having problems socializing a new puppy. What is important to keep in mind is that several studies support the safety and benefits of puppy socialization classes. So that's what you want to look for. Because the fact is, if you wait until after your puppy has had all its vaccinations, he may ultimately lose his life due to behavior problems. So don't sacrifice behavioral health for physical health. They both matter, but they can both be achieved with a proper approach. Last, myth number five, pets soil the house, tear up our things, fill in the blank, whatever problem behavior you don't like, because they are angry at us. And again, this could be no further from the truth, because most of the times when animals are exhibiting these types of behaviors, they have to do with fear and anxiety. It has nothing to do with you. They're not mad that you're gone. They are anxious or they are afraid. Animals don't soil the house out of sight. But they do have a reason for their behavior, and it is often due to fear or anxiety. And again, the way this works is that animals become classically conditioned to experience fear or anxiety in a certain situation. And rather than getting better when there is a repetition of the experience, they get worse. And this occurs due to classical conditioning, which just to explain it simply has to do with an animal learning to associate one event with an emotional state. And the reason why I point that out is because this is not the same thing as operant conditioning, where dogs or any animal learn to behave in a way as to get to make a good consequence happen for them. Okay, that's what happens when you train. But classical conditioning is something that occurs and is associated with physiological responses 
And typically, those are emotional responses. So they are things that the animal has no control over. In the example here, where the dog learns to salivate to the bell, remember that normally he would salivate because he sees food. He doesn't have to learn that. He doesn't have to stop and think, okay, salivate. And when you associate the bell repeatedly with the food, then eventually the dog associates the bell with the food and now will behave as if he's seen food. And salivation is a physiological response like an emotional response. So the dog could just as easily learn that when the bell oh, when the bell rings, the bad man comes through the door and yells at him. And if that happens often enough, then they would learn to be afraid of the ringing at the bell. So animals learn by association and they don't always have control of their behaviors. So when a behavior is due to separation anxiety, you want to be aware that the behavior you don't like is occurring as a result of an emotional state. Don't focus on stopping the behavior, focus on changing the emotional state. And you can often do that with the proper help. Animals repeat behaviors that are rewarded. So whenever a behavior occurs over and over and over, it's just because it meets some need of the animal. And it's rarely safe to just try to stop a behavior without trying to replace it with a behavior that you find acceptable. And barking is one of those behaviors that dogs repeat because they often believe it works for them. If you would like some assistance with your dog, remember that there is a book called Decoding Your Dog that was written by members of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists for pet owners. And it's there to help you learn how to better understand your dog and respond to it in a way that is both empathetic and will successfully help you raise uh, a healthy dog. It was a pleasure to speak to you today, the Dog Care on Air conference, and I hope that if you have questions, you will ask them.